The danger with the 10.30 service is I always psychologically feel like I've got all this extra time and I end up going over time anyway, particularly when I start with what I'm about to do now. Um, first of all, just a few shout outs. David, gee, it's great to see you back on, back on this lofty platform. And um, can I, can I, David is one of my close friends and it's just a joy to serve alongside you, David. And um, thank you for not asking Nikki and I to stand up. That is like my least favorite thing. Like, will you guys stand up? It's like, eh, I don't really want to. Um, so um, thank you for doing that. Um, can I also just say, I just wanted to, uh, just a few encouragements for people. First is Martin and Claudine Septo. Hello, haven't talked to you guys for a while. Um, but as we were worshiping, I felt God put you on my heart. I wanted to first of all say, um, you guys have been faithful stewards of what God has given you and you have been godly, you, you have been godly parents and you have done a really, you know what, you haven't done a perfect job, none of us have, but you've done a good job and God is going to, uh, what I really felt strongly, in our church, we have a, a very difficult family in our church called the Van Heerdens. You might know them. And um, they are a blessing to our church because they exist for more than their biological family. And as I looked across and we were worshipping, I felt like God just really challenged me and encouraged me that God is going to use your family beyond your family. And you are actually called to be spiritual parents of many, many, many more children than your biological kids. So stop looking at your biological kids as your only family. Look beyond. Your biological kids have got friends, and as you open up your home, and as you open up your lives, God's going to use you to be parents for many, because there are many children in our society that need love, and they need um, the embrace and covering of a loving spiritual mum or dad, and you're going to be that, I believe. So I hope that's an encouragement for you. Does people, do you connect with that church? <clears throat> because, I mean, sometimes I look at my family and I think, I've got, an, I've got my hands full with my own family. Sometimes I've got my hands full with just my own life. But God gives us a capacity to use what we have for, um, for, for more than that, for others. Um, also, I just wanted to, I just want to encourage the worship team because... Um, well, two of you, I know, were at a wedding till midnight last night because I was there. So thank you for serving. First of all, Nathan, um, you made me cry. I, I haven't heard you worship lead. I'm trying to get too sentimental, but I will. I haven't heard you worship lead in a very long time, and um, that was beautiful. Thank you, mate. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm crying. Um, and Tanya couldn't go to the wedding yesterday to the ceremony because you were not feeling well. And you got home very late last night and you're up here worship bleeding. Thank you, Tanya. And Tracy, you're just a machine for Jesus. Um, if you've known Tracy for a while, you just see what God is doing in her and through her. And um, just talking to her, she is a minister of the gospel. She is, a, um, she is a pastor and shepherd of God's people. And I see that in the church, but also in her role in, in school communities. I see it wherever she is. She's a, she's a mother hen. And um, Tracy, just thank you for saying yes, and thank you for, and, and also you're, you're like a, a tiger, you're strong, and I love that fire, so thank you very much. Um, you, know, you know how privileged you are as a church to have people leading you that have lived uh, real lives, they're not fake, and they work through stuff, and they sacrifice, so thank you for your sacrifice team. Thank you, Catherine, you've got kids at home and and you're serving you're sacrificing thank you um i just now now i need to thank everyone because <laughs> then finn and the bartholomaeuses will be left out just thank you guys I'll, I'll i'll give you personal encouragement later so this series is called against the flow because it assumes that our society in our world as followers of jesus we are pushing against the tide. Have you ever been at a beach with waves? 
they do exist outside of Adelaide. Um, and there's things called rips, and they take you out. And, and, and when you're pushing against the tide, it, 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 against a rip, it, it takes a lot of effort just to stand your ground. In fact, to stand your ground is not passive, it's active. And if you don't activate your faith, you will not stand your ground. You'll be taken with the flow of the prevailing culture. And for some of you, it's the flow and the culture of your family that's really strong. And it's like it takes guts to go against your family. To be a person of principle sometimes in areas where your family is a little bit um, out of kilter with the convictions of, of your faith. Sometimes it's your work environment, sometimes it's the broader cultural environment. But to stand against the flow, we need to be people of conviction and courage and wisdom. And this series is about the book of Daniel and some of the stories in the book of Daniel. That's what... Um, we and you guys are going to be unpacking over the future weeks. We're actually going to do this series down at our church down at South. And myself and Pastor Sam met up and we kind of planned out this series because I think it's so important. And why do I think it's important? It's because the book of Daniel teaches us how to live faithfully as exiles in a society where our faith and our worldview is a minority and not a majority. Where we don't come from a platform of privilege, but we come from a minority position where we have to serve those that have power. And we have to understand that sometimes our position might be a minority position. So how do we not just try to impose Christian values upon people? Because as much as we might want to try, that won't work. And in fact, last, uh, last time I read the Bible, there's no verse that tells us we have to fight for Christian values. It tells us that when we have the Holy Spirit in us, we are representatives of Christ and we take his light and love with us wherever we go. And the story of the church is that the light of the gospel is not about controlling culture or winning the, the Christian values battle, but it's about changing culture through influence, one person and one community at a time. And our influence is not with might and power and weapons and political might, but it's by the influence of the gospel in changing hearts and minds. You see, if your worldview, and some of you here might feel a bit convicted about this because I can be like this sometimes, that if there was like a big tug of war and it's Christians, or it might even be broader than it, be, might, might be conservative, good, old-fashioned values versus the big bad world, and it's a tug of war, we feel like we're losing. We feel like society is sliding. In fact, I'd like to see a show of hands can I have a show of hands? And, and you might want to compare our society today to the 1980s or the 1990s or the 1950s. Some of you weren't born then, so you might want to compare it to the early 2000s. Um, I secretly resent people born in the 2000s because I just remember it too well. I'm like, oh, I'm so old. Um, can I have a show of hands? If you think that our society today, 2019, is becoming less Christian. Put your hand up. I see that hand, sister. I see that hand, brother. Hands up if you think that our society and our culture is getting uh, more Christian. Um, hands up if you're not sure. Well, you know how some people say there's no right or wrong answer? Well, maybe there's no right or wrong answer to this. I would probably challenge the majority of you in the room, though. And it's not a small majority, it's an overwhelming majority. Um, I would say that there's a number of areas of our society in 2019 where our society, in terms of the values of the New Testament, we are far more Christian if we define Christian by the values of Jesus than previous generations. Um, if you were to look at the rights of people from certain minority groups within our society, if you look at the way people with disabilities are looked after, if you look at basically the freedoms of women in the, around the world, there's a lot of difficulties for women in our society today and still a lot of structural bias against women in our society. 
But things are so much better in that if you're a woman in this room and you could go back in a time machine to any era in history, is there any eras you'd be like, wow, I'd love to go back to that era where women were given so many freedoms and they had so many liberties. I mean, the world, uh, we live in a society where domestic violence is not tolerated by the state. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that husbands in some quarters would laugh about domestic violence and it was seen as, oh, that's just normal. You know, if your wife is misbehaving, just give her a clip. If you don't believe me, watch some old movies and some old TV shows. Um, casual racism. So when you say that the world is getting less Christian, what Christian values are you talking about? Um, when you look at the way previous generations have absolutely stripped bare the environment in, in, and wrecked ecosystems in some societies. And you think, okay, but, but can we be honest as well? There's certain things in our society where it's getting really hard to be a Christian and there's certain areas and certain dis- directions that culture and government are making that I think are pushing against what we would say are the values of the gospel. So I think, wh- why do I say that? Because I don't believe that this tug of war of Christians versus the culture is a new one. I believe that every generation from the 1950s to the 300s to the 500s to the 1500s when Martin Luther was walking around, every generation that seeks to live faithfully in accordance with the gospel is pushing against the values of this world. And we are not called to impose our values. We are called to be transformed by the gospel of Jesus and live out the Christian practices of love and justice and humility and prayer and service. And in the midst of us living out our Christian faith, the values of a culture will change. And when you try to impose that on people, it will never work. In fact, the church is nearly always at its worst when it's got all the power. So what a privilege we have to have very little power in our politics right now. Because we have the ability not to enforce our will, but to win people over with wisdom and with love and from an attitude of service. And that's what this series is about. Just like Daniel and his friends, we're going to read about. They had very little political power, but God used them to turn the most powerful man in the world around and to change a culture. So a bit of backstory. King Nebuchadnezzar, not only did he have a terrible name, he was a terrible man. He had destroyed uh, Jerusalem and ransacked Jerusalem, and he didn't just ransack and kill, but he destroyed and desecrated the temple of God. And he removed all of the faith symbols, and he's like, let's get rid of this Judaism. Let's just purge it from our greater, more sophisticated world. Around 605 BC, the best young future leaders were picked and they were intentionally indoctrinated into Babylonian culture to train them to become the future government leaders and advisors. You see, Nebuchadnezzar knew, I'm not just going to insult your past. Imagine as a church, imagine if you feel like sometimes people insult the history of the church. Or they might, in, they might come in and say, we're going to take away your power now. But not only that, we're going to train all your young people and your most influential young people. We're going to train them in the culture of our way of thinking so that the future of your people, the future of your religion is dead. Man, that's where we pick it up. Daniel 1, verses 3 to 5. Let's look through the screens. Then the king ordered As, um, Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome. Any young men like that in this room? You might want to stand. No. Um, Showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They would be trained for three years and after that they were to enter the king's service. You see, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to disciple the most influential young boys for three years. Someone else did that. His name is Jesus. He discipled these disciples for three years. You know what it tells me? In our culture, just like Nebuchadnezzar tried to disciple and indoctrinate these young boys, 
our prevailing culture is flowing in a particular direction with a lot of values, some of them good, some of them not so good, and you are being discipled by the messages of our world. And the question is, whose voice are you listening to? Whose authority are you submitting to? So there was an intentional and strategic plan to indoctrinate these young boys into the Babylonian culture. Um, The king wanted them to not just conform, but to start thinking like the Babylonians and behaving like the Babylonians and believing what the Babylonians believed. You know how many Christians in our society, cultural Christians, that might not have an active faith life, but they might culturally identify with Christianity. There's very little indistinguishable from them to people that don't have faith. When you look at um, their values of how much they, that they care about the poor and the marginalized, when you look about their prayer life, when you look about the content of what they engage in online or on Netflix, and when you, when you look at the way that they gossip. So, so like a lot of cultural Christians and some of us in this room, there's very little that's indistinguishable from your life to the life of someone that doesn't identify as a Christian. It's just that you get to tick the I believe in God box and my God kind of is of the Christian flavor. Or I culturally identify with Christianity. And if if that's you, I'm not belittling you. I'm just saying that in our society today, um, I don't think that kind of faith is the one that's going to work to really transform your life. It's not the faith God has for you and it's not going to change our world. And um, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, there was a cultural Christianity that a lot of people just said that they're Christians. But now what's happening is the average, if, if you were to have 100 people in a room, the middle person, rather than being a cultural Christian, I think is becoming like a, a soft agnostic. Someone that is drifting away from a nominal belief in God to a nominal belief in agnosticism or atheism. And so what happens is we as Christians are culturally becoming more and more of a minority. And I think that is a wonderful opportunity because people are going to stop conflating hypocritical, war, uh, weak, lukewarm Christianity with the true, authentic, sacrificial Christianity of like taking up your cross and following Jesus and looking a little bit weird. But last time I checked, Christians were a bit weird. I mean, we worship a guy that hung on a, cro- a torture instrument. Some of us hang that torture instrument around our neck. We come to church and we lift our hands because right through the last 2,000 years, even Paul tells in Timothy, he says, men should lift up holy hands in worship. So if you don't lift your hands in worship, well, just, just do it. It's good. It's a sign of surrender and openness. You don't have to. Just do it anyway. Because it's what Christians have been doing for 2,000 years and it's a sign of openness and surrender. And our Prime Minister did it. And I don't know why they, the church or Prime Minister or whoever did it invited the cameras into the church. I reckon that's a bit weird. But anyway, let's just park that for a moment. But anyway, he lifted his hands and, and it was in the papers. And I said, that's so weird. I'm like, yeah, just Christian. It's just normal. And like, yeah, we are a bit weird. I mean, you go to a Catholic church and everyone kneels down. It's like, well, Last time I checked my saviour, God in the flesh died on the cross for our sins. So forgive me if every now and again I want to kneel for him. Forgive me if every now and again I want to open my hands and sing to him. Forgive me if every now and again I, 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 um, I, I'm a young person and I go on a mission trip and I serve the poor and the needy rather than going on a holiday and doing what I want to do because God has changed my life and it's okay if I'm a little bit weird. And you have a spiritual enemy that wants you to think, just like King Nebuchadnezzar, that wants you to think just like the world to the point where if I was to say, what in your worldview is radically different to your friends? You'd be like, ah, not much. That is a great challenge to faith. So let's have a look at, that was a nice song. So I don't believe that if you're going to make it in the, the, with the flow of where the culture's going, if you're passive and if you're not actively engaged, you are going to be swept away. So what do you need to do? We need to stand our ground. Ephesians 6 verses 11 to 13 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after that, and done everything to stand you see my friends 
God wants us to be able to stand so that when people are looking for something that's different, something that's real, something that's solid, something that they can grab hold on when everything around them is slipping away like quicksand, they can see that there's someone that stands against the tide that stands for something but if you're going to stand against the tide and you're going to stand for something you need to be willing to stand out and look a little bit different if you're never standing out and you're always blending in then you're not truly committed to follow Jesus I would suggest because when you follow him you're going to be different because one of the key attributes of God is his holiness his otherness and so when we worship a God that is truly other than We acknowledge that he is above and beyond anything we see in this world. And he is so, and and in his purity, in his power, and his glory. And so when we sing holy, 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 we're saying, God, you are so much beyond me. You are so much more worthy than me. No one's going to walk into the church and they're going to say, wow, I want to change the orientation of my heart I want to change who I'm living for I don't want to live for self I want to live for others I want to live for God because that church was so relevant because that worship leader had the skinniest jeans I've ever seen and that singer she just looked like she could be in the movies and she was amazing and that coffee I mean it was just like better coffee than you get in a coffee shop I mean that's all good stuff and there's nothing wrong with skinny jeans if you're wearing skinny jeans out there but ultimately When people look around and they see when we're sinking as people and we are overwhelmed by our brokenness, we're overwhelmed by our humanity, we're looking for something to hold on to that is eternal, that is solid, that is not subjective, but is objective. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And we say, God, where do I come from? Where am I going? And God is holy. And we cling to Him and so we are drawn into His holiness. And as Christians, He's not just holy and He's not just powerful and He's not just scary. He has come near in Jesus Christ. And so we see His faith and He's not just holy. He's not just fearful. He is beautiful in the cross of Jesus. You see the love of God poured out and you see what God is like for us in Jesus Christ. And you say, God, you are holy. God, you are worthy. And you bow your knees and you lift your hands. That's what we do as Christians. This is not just cosmetic cultural Christianity it's a relationship with the Holy Spirit it's a real expectation of the resurrection so not if but when people get sick and when people die we have a hope of a resurrection this is a living hope we sang about if you have a dead hope or a hypothetical hope then it's not the Christianity that's going to last in this cultural moment a real hope for justice in this world this week my son Josiah had nightmares and and I sat down with him and I said Josiah, we, let's pray. And we, we prayed for the Holy Spirit to bring his peace into the room. But I said, I believe that we don't just pray to God, but God can actually come and meet with us. His presence can actually come and bring calmness to our body. Do you believe that? And if you don't believe that, if you haven't experienced that, there's more for you. Because God's Spirit is his empowering presence with us in this world. He is our counselor. He's our advocate. He's our friend. And he comes and lives within us. He's God's presence with us. And so next time you have a nightmare, don't just go and watch TV. Pray to God and say, God, I need you to come and in a, in a powerful way manifest your presence in my life so I can go back to sleep. That's what I did with my son. And the next day he said, Dad, don't leave. You haven't prayed for me. I need God's presence again. Because I'm, and it's just like he's hungry for it. And then I prayed and he said, but dad, what if, don't go because then what if the Holy Spirit's presence leaves me? And then I'm like, oh son. And so I was able to talk to him about what the Holy Spirit's like. And I said, when you wake up in the middle of the night, you call out and you can call out to God just like daddy can. And then last night, um, Gannett was babysitting him and early in the week as well and he's like oh, I got Gannett to pray for me and he's like no I'm, I, whenever I even doesn't matter who it is I have to get prayed for every night isn't that good because this is a living hope this is a faith that's not about enforcing values it's about practices that bring freedom and bring life and actually appropriate and and make faith real to our everyday life and so that when we encounter people there's a realness there's a livingness there's a practice to our faith in fact um you know uh, people from other faiths they they pray certain times every day uh, one of my favorite uh, soccer players is Muhammad Salah um, who Liverpool won last night, which was fantastic. Uh, it was great. And, um, and, and Liverpool have a couple of devout Muslims in their team. And one of the things I respect about a lot of Muslim as- athletes is they fast during Ramadan, even as professional sports people. You're like, man, I don't know a lot of Christians that would fast if they were professional sports people. 
But there's something about the people respect you when you make decisions out of conviction that show that you're different. They might not agree with you. Verse six, among those that were chosen were some from Judah, uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. These four boys were around 12 to 15. Do we have any 12 to 15s in the room? All right, so we're going to take you away, thousands of kilometers away from your family, and we are going to crush your identity. We're going to change your names. We're going to change your names that are probably godly names, and we are going to name you after pagan gods. How do you feel about that? I mean, your name is important. My son Josiah, his name means Jehovah has healed. So whenever I speak his name, I'm proclaiming that Jehovah has healed. I wonder what your name means. Your name was chosen for a reason. But these boys, these boys that were dedicated to the Lord, Nebuchadnezzar said, we're not just going to change the way that they think. We are going to rebrand them and we're going to give them privilege, but we're going to rebrand them in our image. And then it says, verse 8, but Daniel resolved never to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. This is amazing. Listen to this church. When Daniel and his mates were given names that were stripping them of their identity, basically telling them who you thought you are doesn't matter. We don't respect you. These young boys probably, everything in them wanted to rebel, wanted to say, go and get, you know what, Nebuchadnezzar? And you know what would have happened? They would have been executed. You might want to write this down. General rule in life. Try not to get executed if you can avoid it. Um, Now, some Christians are executed for their faith. But if they took that approach, that unwise approach, that's what would have happened. And they were branded with these names and it was like a label on the outside. But you know what, these boys, they had enough self-identity and an understanding of who they were that they did not rebel against the title or the reputation that man put upon them. It doesn't even matter if that man is the most powerful king in the world. And how many people know that there's going to be people that sometimes put a label on you and say, oh, you're this or you're that, but that does not define who you are. And we as Christians sometimes get so offended by what people think about us that we get all huffity puffity and defensive and we channel all of our energy into defending ourselves. And last time I checked, Jesus Christ was the most accused man for no reason and he spent no time defending himself. Because if you spend your life defending yourself, you'll have no emotional energy for what God has put you on this earth for. You do not live for the validation of man. You live for the validation of God. And God already validates you in Jesus Christ. And so if you, and so these boys, they're like, you can call us whatever we want. It doesn't change who we are. I want to say that in your workplace. Never, you know what? We often as Christians, we have a persecuted, persecution complex. There are people in this world, in the Middle East, in China that are being persecuted for their faith. But the chances are in this room, You have every freedom to live out your faith. The thing that's holding you back is you. Let's not be overly critical of the culture and the government because the greatest thing that holds you and I back from living out our faith is our sin and our comfort and our love for things. And so, but these boys, what did they say no to? They said no to eating the king's food i mean okay so i'm 13 years old i'm taken away from my family and i i kind of don't have any of my creature comforts and i'm in babylon and i'm like my life has been stripped away my identity has been undermined i don't have my mummy i don't have my daddy but guess what silver lining i get to eat the best food in the world and i'm 13 and they're giving me amazing wine like how good is that if all my friends back home could see that I'm drinking. Anyway, and they're like, yeah, no, nah, we're not doing that. Because they knew that this food was um, in the sacrificial process and the ceremonial process was dedicated to pagan gods. And they just said, this is what they did. They said, we will allow our names to be defamed, but we will not be part 
of dishonouring God. And we don't want to make a huff and we don't want to make a puff and we don't want to kind of just be awkward, but we have a conviction that we are worshippers of God and we don't want to participate in something that's worshipping not God, worshipping false gods. And so they just said, they didn't say you're evil. They didn't say, how dare you pagans? They said, would it be okay if we saved you some money and we just want to live out our convictions because we respect you, they respected authority, can we just go vegan for a little bit no like not that there's anything wrong with that <clears throat> now and these boys are like no we're being created to eat meat and no, we're gonna go for vegetables and water how does that sound and they used wisdom to not cause undue offense but sometimes you can't help offend it but sometimes you can help offending. If you have the option, try not to offend. The gospel is sometimes offensive, don't get me wrong, but if you have the option to not offend, try not to. And they started this vegetable diet because they had made advanced decisions about what they are are and aren't going to do when they're overwhelmed in a culture pushing in a different direction. I wonder if you make advanced decisions about what you're going to drink or whether you're going to drink alcohol in certain environments. I wonder if you make advanced decisions about what parties you will or won't go to. I wonder if you make advanced decisions about what gossip you will be part of next time you're around your family because how many people know families are pretty bad for gossip? Or are you just going to say, you know what, I actually don't want to be part of this and you just extract yourself and you walk away. How many of us need to make advanced decisions about things, not pointing out sin or failure in others, but being people of conviction in advance? You see, um, that's what these boys did. They said, we're not going to defile ourselves. We're not going to perpetuate stuff that dishonors God or maybe that, that hurts other people. We, we are going to take a stand for God's name. And I think as Christians, wouldn't it be great if we not, didn't take stands to defend ourselves, but we defended those that don't have a voice? Because there's people in our world that don't have a voice, people, marginalised people, and wouldn't it be great if we made more noise about them and less noise about our own rights and needs? Um, my brother-in-law, I've shared this before, but I re respect him. He's a very successful accountant, and he's working for a significant firm in Sydney. And he was working on the biggest contract at that time in his company, which was one of Australia's biggest betting agencies. And he felt convicted in his spirit. Um, and he said, I, I don't really like what the betting industry does for our society. I don't want to perpetuate the harm that it caused. And so he went quietly to his boss and he said, I'm going to finish this week of work. I'm going to finish the job that you've been given. So he honoured his authority. Because as Christians, we, there's a way to honour and respect those put over us. And he said, but after that, I don't want to be part of this contract anymore. And all of his work colleagues knew that he was sacrificing potential promotion, bonuses, all this sort of stuff because he chose not to work in the biggest contract in his um, accounting firm. And I respect that. You know what I respect? Rochelle, where are you? Oh, hi, hi Roshi. Um, I respect Rochelle and Yen, who, Yen Daly, who's living overseas, that have, have invested significant time <laughs> into earning law degrees and I asked Yen and I think I've asked um, Rochelle as well how many people in doing law and I just assume there's heaps of people like 50% of the class are going into law for philanthropic reasons or they just want to go into law so they could help people pro bono or they could help people poor overseas or they could help work for justice in this world and they said well really actually there's only a couple of us that really actually want to work for non-profits and not go into it for a career. I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah, nah, just... And, and it's like, so Rochelle and Yen, what do they have in common? They're followers of Jesus. And they have the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of people that aren't followers of Jesus that still do a whole heap of incredible things. But I love the fact that as Christians, they have the light of the gospel and it compels them to be different to be people of conviction, to be people that take jobs, not for what gives you the highest pay packet, but the, the, a job that you can make the most, uh, see the most, most good and the most justice take place. 
I know some of you in this room have made decisions that haven't been for your own betterment, but have been for the betterment of other people. That's what it means, not just to change culture, but that means to be Christian and change a culture. Let's read on for verse 12. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing to eat but vegetables and water to drink. I mean, quite a few times Nikki's tried to get me to do the Daniel fast. I'm like, honey, I prefer just to eat nothing. Like, it'd be so disappointing just eating vegetables that I may as well just go cold turkey. It's like, there's no, there's no coffee provision here. Mm, it's not going to cut it. Like, seriously, hun, that's not even embellishment. She's tried to get me to do it so many times. Anyway. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you have seen. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate royal food. I believe if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God will give you what you need. And you you, you will be blessed. You'll be blessed, not so that you can be blessed but so that you can be useful for God for the next season that you're in Daniel honors authority and he stands out in a good way now some of you in this room might be tempted I want to stand out but you might want to write this down when you stand out try not to be rude try not to be a jerk because let me just say something like right now we could do an experiment, a social experiment. I could get my phone, I could whip up Insta or Facebook and I could write, make a quote about the founder of Islam, Muhammad, and I could be really, really offensive to a lot of people and I could think that I'm being a person of conviction and bravery standing against the political correct culture because you know political correctness is and i have to say i think political correctness in our society has gone crazy can i hear an agreement but that doesn't mean as a full of jesus i just want to like offend hundreds of people or people you know like not just muslims but heaps of other people i could easily do that i mean i could easily write a whole pile of social commentary in such a way and i could come across in such a way where rather than building bridges with people or rather than sharing the gospel, I shut down whole heaps of people from actually ever wanting to converse with me ever again. Now, hear me on this. There are times where we will stand and we will be unpopular. But let's be people of conviction and wisdom. And wisdom doesn't mean you do nothing. Sometimes you have to take a stand and be willing to put your neck out there. Verse 19, the king talked to them and he found no one equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. If Daniel and his buddies had just blended in, nothing would have happened. But, and if they'd been belligerent and unwise, they would have been executed. Don't be executed. Don't be a jerk if you you can avoid it. And, but also... Don't just go with the flow and blend in so that your witness is impotent. Time and time again, you'll be drawn towards one of these extremes. Last time I checked, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah who died on a tree, never compromised his faith. But people were drawn to him because they liked the way he annoyed religious people. They just liked that. They liked the way he annoyed the people that were really strong in their certainty of what they believed, but they were pretty ugly on the inside. And he, they liked the way he challenged that. And they liked the way that even though he was a holy man that lived a blameless life, they liked the way he met with people that no one else met with. Wouldn't that be great if we as a church cannot just stand against the flow, but we can stand up in such a way that people say, I may not agree with you. I find it weird that you raise your hands in church. I find it weird that you kneel. I find it weird that you give a portion of your income towards others, towards the local church, but I respect you. And they come to a moment where the person that they call upon is you and not their other friend. Are you ready, church? Are you ready to actually be just a little bit different? 
let's make Christianity weird again. Not make America great again. Make Christianity weird again. Not weird by being weird, but just the fact that we should be different because our God came as a carpenter and died on a tree and he rose again. And then when he appeared to his disciples, he made them breakfast and embraced them. That's the kind of God I serve and that's the kind of God I want to live for. Can we close our eyes and stand to our feet? Can I have, just as everyone has their heads bowed and their eyes closed, I actually want to give people an opportunity to respond to the Lord for salvation this morning. When Nathan was sharing from Daniel 7 before, it reminded me of this language of being in the presence of God, that God wants you to bring him into his presence. When I shared that story about my son Josiah, some of you in this room, you actually didn't know what God's, you're like, what does God's presence feel like? That sounds weird. I believe that every Christian, after the days of Jesus, to be a Christian wasn't just something of thinking. It was an experiential faith. It was a faith that involved the practices of your life. It was a faith that involved emotion. It was a faith that involved thinking and reflection. It was a faith that encompassed your whole of life. And so if you've just got a rational belief or you might have doubts, but right now, this, even this idea of God's presence, God, the, if there is an eternal God, maker of the heavens and earth, this God knowing you and spiritually waking you up and showing you that you belong to him, that you came from him and that you are on this earth for a reason because you're connected with the creator and he has a plan for your life. You see, when Jesus died on a cross, one of the things he said to the thief on the cross next to him that asked for mercy was, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that word paradise, it doesn't mean heaven. It means today you will be with me in the garden. You see, there's some people here and you think about God as being so out there, but he actually wants to draw you near so that today you can be, it's almost like walking with him in the garden where you come close to him and you come to him and you try to get to know him, but then you look at him and you realize he already knows everything about you and you can have peace in this life because you have peace with God. And so when Jesus was on the cross and he said, today you'll be with me in paradise, what he was saying is, you will be intimate with God and there will be no separation because you are forgiven and you are free. And my friends, I want to say to you this morning that today you can be with him in paradise. You can receive the presence of God through the Holy Spirit. And that's what a Christian is. It's a child of God born afresh of the Holy Spirit. His Spirit comes and lives in you and it's not just belief, it's a transformation. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So my friends today, if you will just receive what He's done for you, if you receive the sacrificial life, death and resurrection of Jesus for you, If you just say, God, thank you for sending Jesus and I receive what you've done for me. I need you, God. I need you. I don't want to push you away. I I believe there is a God, but I don't want to just know about you, God. I want to know you. And if you are God, please bring me home. I want to know you. I want to not just see you from afar, but I want to walk with you. I want to be reunited with you. I want to know where I came from and where I'm going. I want to accept what Jesus has done and I need you. I can't do life on my own anymore. I can't keep on going down the road I'm going and I want to turn and follow you. If that's you, my friends, today is a day of salvation. Today you can be with him in paradise. There's hundreds of us in this room that have made this decision and we realise it wasn't the decision that we made, it was that God woke us up and we just received the fact that he had chosen us. And so if you're here today and you realise that you can't go on the way you're going any longer and you need to turn and follow God, you need to acknowledge that you're a sinner and you need God's love and mercy and forgiveness and you want to receive God's Holy Spirit, I want you right now, without hesitation, and no one else needs to see it, to put your hand up right now so I can acknowledge you, and then you can put it down. Is there anyone in this room, and you need to get your life right with God, and you're just saying, I need to come home to God. I need to accept what He's done. Yes, thank you. You can put your hand down once I've seen you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just put your hand up. 
I'd like to pray a prayer for you. You don't have to come out the front or anything, but I just want to pray a prayer for you in your seats. Anyone else? You just need to respond to God. Today you will be with me in paradise. Thank you. I see that hand. You can put that down. Today, today, God's mercy is for you. Church, why don't you just open up your hands as a sign of openness and surrender and pray this prayer after me. Dear God, maybe you might want to pray this out loud after me. Dear God, thank you that you are a loving Father. I acknowledge that not only are you real, but you love me and you sent Jesus for me. Thank you for his cross and thank you for his resurrection so I can be forgiven and I can be free. Thank you because of Jesus, I can be a child of God. I receive you now. Please give me your Holy Spirit and make me a new person. Help me to follow Jesus and his way, and his teachings. Thank you that I am saved by your loving kindness and your grace. And even though I fall, I can get up again because you are with me. Thank you that today I can be with you in paradise. That there is no separation between me and you because nothing can separate me from your love. Amen. Who thinks that's good news, church? Hallelujah. What I want to do is the team leads us. We've got a little bit of time, not much, but I'd like to invite you. If God has spoken to you about standing, and it's not standing as a cultural warrior, it's not standing in a way that, but it's about saying, I want to be a, a woman of conviction. I want to be a man of conviction in this cultural moment we live in. I'd love you to come out the front. Maybe you're saying, I just need to be wise because I I struggle to know how to be a person of wisdom and courage. If you want to come out the front, if you're in your family and you're just saying, you know what, I just, I, I, I want to be a good representative of Jesus in the place where he's got me and I want to be useful for him. I'd love you to come out the front. As we worship, we're just going to get someone to put a hand on you and just to pray God's blessing because I believe that God actually wants you to be, you don't have to try to be different. You just stay close to Him and people will see that you're different. You don't have to be who you're not. You just be who you are. But if you're here and you just feel like I'd love someone to stand with me or maybe you're one of those people that just put your hand up to receive salvation, you might want to come out the front and say, I'd love someone to just put a hand on my shoulder. We're only just going to take five minutes. But right now, if you need prayer, God has spoken to you in this message. And like Daniel and like these boys, they felt like everything was pushing them in the one direction, but they said, no, no, we are not going to live out the values of this world. We want to be people of conviction and not go with the flow. We'd love to pray with you because do you know what? It's hard being a follower of Jesus. It's been hard for 2,000 years, but God has not left you alone. You have the Holy Spirit living in you and He is going to help you to be the man or woman you're called to be, the young person. So even young people here, we'd love to pray for you. So um, guys, can you lead us in a song and come out the front now, um, church? Who's going to be the first? It's always fun being the first. Don't be embarrassed. You come now.